and we are live hello everyone and welcome to foresight tv obviously i am not steve moran if you have been following us on social uh my name is rachel hill i'm our creative director here at senior living foresight stepping in for steve today giving him a much deserved break i am here with my guest jason cutter and we're gonna talk about how to sell without selling how do we do that jason uh it's easy and it's complicated uh and i know that we're gonna dive into as much as we can <laughs> we sure are but first let's roll that intro <laughs> Hey guys, Steve Moran here. <laughs> What'd you think of that intro, Jason? <laughs> I, I love it. I was taking notes and I definitely want to make something like that for my own intros. Oh, please do. We're, we're such a fan of animated Steve over here. So <laughs> I love it's it. a good fill in for uh, the real Steve, uh, but I'm glad that you're here. Oh, thank you. It is so nice to have you. I'm so glad we connected. And like I said, we're going to talk about how to sell without selling. You have this wonderful book selling with authentic persuasion. I I devoured this book. It is so, so good. I want to make sure I get it centered there so everyone can see it. It's so good. And what's interesting to me is you have a background in sales, 17 years, but correct me if I'm wrong, you studied marine biology. How does this, yep. how do we get here, Jason? Oh, let's see. Let's try to keep it short because I know we only have so much time today. Um, <laughs> My uh, foray into sales was mostly against what I thought I'd ever want to do. Uh, the punchline, the short version is, at one point, I was standing on a boat tagging great white sharks, and that still seemed like the smartest and safest way to go instead of dealing with people and humans as a career path. That was a reflection of being a only child, late bloomer, bullied, awkward, shy kid to two wonderful analytical parents who also hated and distrust salespeople with a passion. My mom is a banker, was a banker and moved up before she retired. She saw the behind the scenes. She saw the bad stuff salespeople did to people. And so I, that was what our family believed. Um, such that I never imagined I would do anything with people. Uh, and then I found that I was actually pretty good with them. And then I fell into sales at 27 and then was never taught how to sell, never given training. So I kind of made it up as I went along and then sold in a way that felt right to me and then have trained and helped hundreds and hundreds of people since then um, sell in a way that's different than you know the extremes, right? The the boiler room wolf of wall street or the order taker failing at sales yeah i love so much of what you said there and kind of that that breakdown of all of those stereotypes that i i want to just run through uh during this episode because it's it's so true you know sales people they're pushy they don't care they don't listen although i will say i think the interesting thing is the last part they're listening i think is key to actually understanding what you're selling. And you talk a lot about your why in that book, in your book. And could you talk a little bit about why and that purpose of listening and trying to understand really why are you selling? Like what, what was your why? I kind of want to start with and then maybe lead into that for other salespeople, please. Yeah. So for me, what I realized, mostly in retrospect, I was kind of on autopilot for a long time. It was partially when I started writing the book, I was like, okay, what, what do I do that has made me successful and special in sales, right? That doesn't fit any mold. Like it's not a Sandler thing or a this thing or a that thing. Like, what is it that I do? And um, I realized for me, I had always, even as a kid, 
like solving problems, like solving puzzles. I took that and was using that in more of a science realm. Like as a kid, once I went from my dinosaur phase into my shark phase and my marine biology phase, and then like it was like understanding and dissecting and solving problems and studies and, and research and, and whatnot. Then I realized over time that I liked applying that to people as well, which is having conversations and then helping solve problems. How do I help them? Uh, even to this day, like whether it's with sales or anything else, like what advice, what knowledge do I have? How can I help someone get to a better place? And I realized for me that that's what sales was all about, right? Is that why of helping other people much to the, uh, much to the dismay of many bosses I've had in the past uh, who tried to just purely incentivize me with money and say, well, you'll make this much more money if you do more. I'm like, I'm already going to do more. And that's not why I'm doing it. Like I'm doing it because this feels like what I want to do. And obviously the money is then the byproduct, right? Like I'm not doing it for the money. The money is, is the result. Uh, some people are driven by money first. For me, it was like, I just want to help people. Um, one of my first sales jobs was helping people who are in foreclosure. Right. And the price of failure for that was the sheriff coming and kicking them out of their house. Um, and so there's a significant cost. So it's like, how do I help people? Uh, and that's what really drives me. That's the biggest thing. And now with what I do with other people is I just want to help them in any way that I can. Uh, and that's a big shift because when you do that in sales, then sales is about service. Like what you're saying about listening is when you're doing sales in a different way as a professional would, in my opinion, sales is not something you're doing to somebody, which is that old, I'll just say a gross mode of like, I'm doing this to you for my benefit versus sales is something you're doing for somebody or with them to help them. And then you're winning as well. I love that. And I love how applicable that is, obviously, to senior living right now. I mean, it's just it's a crisis in the industry right now. And I, I, I think some people would even say, Rachel, maybe that's an understatement. You know, I, I am an industry outsider. Clearly, I'm the creative person over here. And, you know, I, I give Steve so much credit for really having a pulse of what's going on in the industry. And I think exactly what you're talking about is salespeople in senior living can take so much of what you're saying and apply that because this is all about service and you can break that down into so many ways you know you're helping someone get the care they need you're helping with occupancy you're helping you know families you know these older adult children get their parents into the type of community that they need to have the proper care yeah and, and i, I love think that. oh yeah. And, and what's interesting for me, because I'm also a, a semi industry outsider as well to this, yeah. uh, I did speak at the Smash conference last year, which was fun. I uh, got invited to uh, speak there. I mean, I come from inside telephone call center type background. And then now as a consultant, it's a wide range. Um, I've seen the senior living side from a customer with my grandmother and then my grandfather. And so I've experienced that. To me, sales is sales at a basic level and the fundamentals are the same. One of the biggest things I see that's missing in this kind of a sale is people default to order taker mode or they're trying to force things and they don't really know how to make it applicable to that person while also moving them forward because you can't force somebody to make that kind of a lifestyle change because that's a huge deal for most people like they're giving up their something they've known for a long time to move in but You've got to also not let them just stay stuck. So you've got to help them and then guide them for the right reasons, for their reasons, which goes back to your listening comment, which is like, why do they want this? And then how do I help them? And then how do I keep them on track? Mm, yeah, be beautifully said. I agree. It's like making sure that someone isn't stuck. I think it's so easy to feel stagnant, especially in sales in senior living, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I want to touch on two things quickly that that you brought up. One, also a uh, call center person here, cold calling, did it for so many years. That was my past life before I took a creative direction. <laughs> and boy, do I feel you there. And, and the second thing I want to touch on is I would love if you're comfortable or whatever you'd like to share, sort of that process that you're talking about with, uh, with your grandmother and sort of being on the other end of that. I think that'd be so helpful for our, our audience to hear. 
Yeah, I mean, I think the the big thing that I saw with both of my family members that went through it was there was a reason they needed to do it, right? There was something that was inspiring this change. My grandma was on her own, able-bodied, able mind. It wasn't anything like that with limitations. She just had a giant house she didn't need. She'd had it for way longer than she needed by herself and a lot less, a lot simpler, a lot easier. Mm. Just make things easier and better for her. She didn't need to be driving anymore. Um, and so, you know, getting to a place where she was comfortable with that, knowing she was changing her whole lifestyle and then understanding that this was a safe, smart choice. And fundamentally, what I saw in the sales process that was done okay, but is generally missing is helping really straight ahead acknowledge the things that are the concerns and the worries from the family, such as to like, preempt the buyer's remorse that's going to happen, right? Where someone says, oh, like, I don't know if I want to do this. Oh, I, I made the wrong choice. How to do that? Now, what happens is most salespeople are afraid to tackle those things head on because they just want to make the sale, whatever the sale is. In this case, we're talking about senior living, but they just want to make the sale. They don't want to bring up too much stuff. They don't want to talk about the negatives. They don't want to talk about these things that might blow their chances of the sale. And the challenge is, is from a company perspective, what you want is those kind of conversations because you want someone who becomes a customer, comes to your residence, is is a part of your community, and then is happy and stays. Um, and it's all the things that people are afraid of. Uh, really confident sales professionals understand that and go, here's what's going to be. Also, here's how this is going to work. I know this is a big change. And then covering those kind of things. Yeah, I think it's addressing that elephant in the room. That's the only way you move past that. And I want to dive into this a little more because you talk about five traits of a good salesperson. And I know that this is going to be something that is so helpful. I'd love for you to just give a quick rundown of, you know, a high level overview of what those are. Yeah. And this one is so important, especially when we look at people who kind of aren't sure they should be in sales. They default to order takers. What I see a lot in the in the senior housing, senior living world is people who they're hired, they're thrown in there, might not be a lot of sales training. Uh, maybe they're coming from more of a customer service background. Maybe they're just more of the nurturing, caring type. So they care about the people, they want to help them. And then there's this whole sales side, which could be gross. Um, for me, it was part of what I wrote in the book and the, the part that you're referring to is this whole nature versus nurture, right? Is it about natural born salespeople, which I'm not going to take the time now. They can read in the book or I, I'll chat with people afterwards. But like there's that debate. And I don't think there's such thing as a natural born salesperson. I think there's some traits that people have that lend themselves well. I also think there's people who grow up and they're young and you can see it in them when they're like three or four. And then by the time you meet them in their 20s or 30s, they've been selling people things for a long time. They've just a pro at it. Um, so there's five traits that you mentioned. And I'm an example of this where I didn't feel like I had these and I made myself effective at them. And so in order of importance, it's openness, curiosity, creativity, persistence, and authenticity. And a lot of times in sales, people think, oh, to be successful in sales, you just have to be very persistent. But if you're not open and curious, which means you're not open to new ideas, open to what you know, concepts that might work, open to a new script, open to a sales training, if you're not open to feedback, if you're not curious about people and you're not asking questions and you're just brutally persistent, you're going to be a persistent jerk that's just going to steamroll over people, right? And we all have met those salespeople and watched those movies about persistent jerks in sales. Um, so that's why it's important because if you're open, then you're curious and you're creative and you're persistent and authentic, it works well. Uh, and again, I'm a great example of that. I was not curious about people. I was really not a fan of people for a long time. We're talking like the first 19, 20 years, not a fan. Um, and then I learned to be curious and open. Um, yes. And, and so I'm, I'm a good, most people don't believe that when they talk to me, they're like, no way. I'm like, yeah, I'm serious. So uh, those five traits are really important. And I think you develop those. Also, it's really important to hire for those because you want to hire for the, 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 the personality, behavior, and abilities on that side. And you can teach. If somebody's open and curious, you can teach them how to do anything, including sell. Yeah, I think that's such a huge aspect of, like you said, any job. Is that person coachable? 
And I, yeah. I, I think that's that's such a huge indicator of whether or not they're going to be successful rather than like at that laundry list of things like on the resume. At the end of the day, I'm, it sounds like you would agree that doesn't matter. Nope. nope. <laughs> not not first. Like the other stuff will come into play. It's really you, you have to also assess if you're going to take someone who has no sales experience, but they're a cultural fit for your company and they're open and curious. That's going to take a long time to develop them. Are you patient enough? Are you okay with that? Do you have the resources to teach someone how to have conversations and sell? Most organizations yes. don't. So first you got to make sure you have some stuff over here. Then you need some basic experience. But again, that goes against the model, which is let me just hire someone with a lot of experience and throw them out there and they should be able to sell for me. Problem is they're going to sell the way they want to sell. Um, and they won't want to do it your way. If you don't have a way, they're definitely not going to do it that way. Um, and here's the other thing that's just kind of brutally true for most situations. If they were so amazing, they wouldn't be looking for a job. So like it, if they were so good, they wouldn't be on the market unless there's something weird that happened. Um, right. But that openness and, and, and curiosity is so important. Yeah. And let's touch on a couple of other these. So we've got create creativity, um, you know, being authentic and then, of course, being persistent. So let's like let's briefly touch on those. Yeah. So the creativity part really comes into both when you're looking at situations and, and being creative and understanding things, but in the moment with that perspective client, right? With that new resident, with that new person that you want to enroll. Um, it's about being creative because they're going to come up with issues. They're going to come up with challenges. Oh, I don't have this. Oh, I need to talk to this person. Like, oh, I got to overcome this. Or I don't know when I'm going to sell my house. Like, you've got to be creative. Otherwise, you're just an order taker. If you're just like, okay, sounds good. Let me know when you're ready. Then that's that's rough. Most companies can't survive off of pure order taking, especially with the marketing that's being done, with the occupancy that needs to be hit. Like, there's so many expenses that go into it. You can't afford order takers who are just waiting for people to hand them money. Yeah. And then persistence is also important, right? You just can't have someone sitting by. They've got to be persistent, but it's got to be on the backs of those other things, which is they're going to go after it, right? They've got to make those calls. They got to follow up on those leads. They can't just call somebody one time who filled out a form online and hope that's going to be enough and then just wait for more easy people to walk through the door. They have to be persistent. They have to want it which goes into like, why are they there? Why do they want to be successful? Like you mentioned yes. about me earlier. Um, and then I think the authenticity piece obviously is vital. Uh, that's why I wrote the book um, is that that's important, like for themselves and for your future residents, for your customers is that authentic piece. That's what will resonate with people more than anything else um, is somebody who's authentic and real. They don't have to be perfect. They don't have to be slick. They don't have to be amazing smooth talkers that are charismatic storytellers if they're real and they're authentic and they want to help people and you give them a process to follow as a salesperson that's more than enough more better than what most people use yeah and i will say to that you know that's one of the biggest things that stood out to me in your in your book and you know in addition to call center uh work i actually work selling gym memberships and you know, I played soccer for all these years. So like I was athletic, but long story short, like put on a, a bunch of weight in college as you tend to do. And then I had dropped 40 pounds and in being vulnerable and sharing my story, that's what sold my memberships. It wasn't that, oh, we have a steam room, we have a laundry service. It's like, no, it was that, oh, she's a human being. You're, I always feel like you're never selling a product. You're selling yourself to that person. Yeah. And I think those stories, those testimonials, it is always more effective when you are your own customer, right? Of whatever you use, or you've gone through that journey, uh, which we can talk about, you know, some stuff I've, I've been speaking about in addition to when I put out the book, which is the role of the salesperson, but the more that they can relate to you and you can relate to them and you can show them that you were able to do it, which means they do it. That's why 
the you know very effective speakers, presenters, salespeople out there, they were once in this position, they've gone to the other side, they know how to help you. Obviously, yeah. that's tough in a situation like this with senior housing, because most likely the people on your sales team have not been a resident of senior housing. Um, I'm pretty sure, just a guess, um, and may or may not have had any family members that have been a part of that. And so part of what you want to do is help people get connected to it so they feel like they understand the value. Um, usually what happens is if somebody's in sales of senior housing long enough, they've heard enough stories that help them understand the value of it and or the worst case scenario of what could happen if they don't, you know, move in. Yeah, I I agree. And I think I love that you gave that advice because I do think it is tricky if you obviously have, have not been in a community, but also to that credit, you know, uh, to that point, you know, I know it's difficult right now, but depending on what the protocol is, go, go in tour these communities, get, get that sort of boots on the ground understanding, you know, be in the back while there's maybe an activity going on, or, you know, that's one of the things that, that I did. I toured a community and I was like, oh, wow, this is really different than, you know, ages ago when my mom was a nurse in a nursing home. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is, this is a different world. So I think yeah. that's super helpful. Yeah. And obviously nursing home versus senior community, independent living, that yes. has a different feel as well. I remember when my great grandfather was in a VA nursing home and that just feels like a step up ish from a hospital. And, mm -hmm. you know, nobody wants to go there or send their family member there versus what a community feels like. And I think one of the big things too, and there's always a delicate balance with this, but I always impart this on salespeople. I don't want them to become fear mongers, which a lot of people in sales think that that's what they're supposed to do, like scare people about the worst case scenario and use that fear to to make sales. There's some some sales programs out there that teach that, which I don't yeah. recommend. Um, but I always like I said, with the foreclosure example is I always want people, no matter what they're selling, to understand what the worst possible outcome is for someone who doesn't sign up. And this could be for, you know, a B2B marketing program it could be for you know consumers buying something or getting out of debt or getting into senior housing or into a community it's like what happens if they don't right what happens if that person that senior stays on their own doesn't move into community something happens no one's around or their family's not around yeah. or they just can't get to what they need to anymore what does that look like what is the snowball um so that they understand like that's the value they're providing um, yeah. and, and where that is, even if, again, they're not a customer themselves. Yeah. And I think what, what you're getting at too, and I'd love for you to break this down further is basically persuasion versus manipulation. And I, I think those are at two completely opposite ends of the spectrum, but I think that line is really blurred and maybe some people morally, like find that morally ambiguous, you know, ambiguous and like don't yeah. know where to go with that. So I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. So, uh, and I love that question. And what's fun, I'm going to use air quotes. What's fun <laughs> is that when you write a book and you make up a title and you put it out there, people have their own opinions and thoughts. Uh, people who feel like no persuasion is bad, right? Mm -hmm. Authenticity is an overused word, right? Like I've had all kinds of different people uh, with their thoughts on it. Um, here's what I do know is if we look at the definitions, manipulation is very clear, right? Manipulation is when you do something to something else for your own benefit that may or may not benefit the other party, right? Other uses of the words manipulation would be like manipulating clay into a bowl. The clay doesn't have a vote. Doesn't matter what the clay wants. The clay is going to do what you tell it to do, right? Manipulating wood, manipulating this, when we deal with people, it's I'm going to get you to do something through some kind of process, through something. I'm going to get you to do it. Um, it's going to benefit me. I don't care what happens to you. It could benefit you. There's a random chance that it might benefit you as well, but I don't really care. Right? We see it in relationships. We see it in sales. We see it in all those kinds of things. Persuasion is not as clear with that, which is why some people debate that with me. Mm. Persuasion is I'm going to get you to move forward on something that should benefit you, but it doesn't say it will benefit you 
or who's going to benefit. I'm just going to persuade you to take some action. For me, that's why in my book, the section that I wrote on persuasion is about positive persuasion. My goal is to persuade somebody to take an action that's going to benefit them. And if it benefits me, that's great as well. Seven billion people on the planet. I don't need to be benefited every time I persuade somebody to do something. It'll always work out, right? There's enough people no matter what. Um, and I think that's the key is, is that intent behind it, which is I'm going to persuade you to do something that's for your benefit. And when you sell that way and you're in that role and you're having those conversations where that really helps is when people say, well, you're just trying, like, let's say in this example, you're just trying to get me to sign up and move in here because that's your job, because you're in sales and because you guys just need to fill rooms, right? Then when that comes up, you hopefully already know why that person should move in and what they need and how it's going to benefit them. And you can combat that with no, like I want you to move in. I think this is important for you. And here's what you told me. And here's why this matters to you, right? Like there's enough people out there. I've said that before. I've had people challenge me on the phone. They're like, well, you're just doing this because you're getting a commission. No, 7 billion people on the planet. Like, I don't need to help you. Like, I don't need to force you to do this. I want to see you do it. We both know it's going to help you. But as soon as I hang up the phone, I've got more people to call. Like, this isn't about me. Um, and some variation of that I think is important. So it's really that intent behind it where this is for you first. It's that service, right? Sales is something you're doing for somebody and with somebody first. And then benefiting. That's where it's also important to make it win-win. We don't want win-lose, which is you're winning, I'm losing because I'm giving away the farm. I want to make sure you're winning first and then we win as a company. Yeah. And I, I think that's that's such a huge part of the mission of Senior Living Foresight too. It's about service, like genuinely, how do we make this industry better? And again, I think it comes back to understanding your why. And what I find fascinating, what I, I sort of want to dive into here in the latter part of our conversation is this idea of this is so much more mental and psychological as opposed to like this. It almost feels like so, I, don't, I don't know if I want to throw out like arbitrary, but like that almost it's like it's like the selling aspect almost should be secondary. This is just so much about you know, your mental state going into the sale and the psychology of sales. Like if I was telling someone about about this book, I would say, oh, this is a really interesting book on the psychology of sales. So I would love for you to sort of talk a little bit more about that and kind of what that means to you and what made you want to take that approach. Well, and and that's a that's a deep question. I love that you asked it because it's so important. Talking about the book, what was what was fun and interesting in writing it is that most sales books are like, say this, ask for the clothes here. Here's my top 10 tips to like get people to buy from you. And here's the NLP that you can use to like get people to corner themselves into buying from you, right? And here's how to handle a spouse and like all like the the tactics and the tricks. I, in fact, I, I it's in storage now, but I have a three, it's about 300 page book on everything to say and do to sell timeshare. It's literally a manual I bought on Amazon for what to say, how to walk people through the property tour, how to point at things like universal timeshare sales strategies. And I was like, this is gross that it's like laid out this way, but it's like a manual. But what about the mental side, right? Like what about the other part? It was just, it's a fascinating read, but you're right. And so for my book, what I wrote is, and I even set it up in the beginning is that there's some strategies and tactics, but it's not till the third part of the book, which is the intangibles and some things you should know. But if you don't have the mental side down, the authentic side and the persuasion piece, and there's a reason they're in order. Again, if you're overly persuasive, but you're not authentic, it's not going to work. And if you're only authentic and not persuasive, you're an order taker who people like, but no one's going to buy from. And so you need those parts. Back to your question which is so important is sales is a hundred percent a mental game that's mostly ignored and not focused on for salespeople. And there's the mental health side, which I'm not even going to get into the mental health piece of it, but it is a mental game. You are up against an amazingly difficult opponent when you're in sales, right? If you play basketball, so I'm a big basketball fan of, of most sports, you, you know, 
I'm really good. You're really good. You've got some tricks. I got some tricks, right? You look at the NBA and that level, those are pros playing against pros. They've been working on it for a long time for most of their life. And it's just a battle of seeing. That's why the, the third section of my book is called the intangibles, which is it's the little things that one person does over another gives them the advantage in that kind of game or in war or whatever. The problem is, is in sales, you're up against an even bigger opponent, which is the fears and part of our mind that doesn't like change. And that part of our brain has been in effect, keeping us alive as a species for a really long time. Tens, thousands, millions, whatever amount of years you want to say, you're up against something that's been dominating the planet for a very long time. And that's hard. And then you have your own mental side that you have to deal with. And then here's the problem is most companies, most organizations don't give enough training. They don't give coaching. They don't give support, right? If we look at, again, a professional sports team, let's take basketball or even soccer. They play once a week at the most. What you see on TV or on the field or on the pitch is three to four hours of their week. The rest of their time, 90, 95% is training, coaching, watching game footage, practicing, running scenarios, getting help, coach, physical, mental, everything. What you see is a small snippet. For sales, it's the Super Bowl all day, every day, no practice, no training, no role playing, no script stuff. Just get in there. Good luck. You try to win. Um, and that's unfair. It's business. You can't spend 95% of the week practicing and then have three hours a week of sales calls, right? Like that doesn't work either. Um, but companies go too far the other extreme, which is good luck. Here's a script or not. And here's what to say. And here's how to give a tour and good luck. Um, and, you know, if you're amazing at sales in most industries, you close 30% of the time right? Maybe 40, maybe 50, depending on your leads, depending on where they're coming from, which means you're still losing 50, 60, 70% of the time. And that's hard. That's if you're amazing. Yeah. And most people aren't amazing. Uh, that's so much to, to break down because it's true. And I, I think, I think what a lot of companies struggle with is how do you find that balance? Right. And let's, you know, let's, let's, let's be real. You have to make these sales right now like it's it's a tough time like i'm not gonna you know stand here and kind of ignore you know the the economic side of that and yeah. the the struggle and the the pandemic and all of those things that have been thrown at this industry and i you know one of one of the interesting things i i, I heard though um there's this this guy i love he's a philosopher jay shetty and he's like you cannot operate in a fear mindset though. And I, I kind of wanted to shift our conversation to that because I think when you are constantly like in that, that fight or flight, like I've got to do this, sales are low. I, and, 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 and I think you, you struggle and, and, and you can't move forward. So I bring that up to say the, where, where do you suggest maybe even just starting with that balance of trying to train but also get the work done and 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 shift that that cultural mindset honestly in 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 sales what's like one or two sort of low hanging pieces of fruit there that we we could get started with i i think that's a a great question rachel and i think that's a really tough one because what happens is in you know in what you're talking about with jay shetty in that mindset and what happens in companies, especially when occupancy is low, sales are low, leads aren't getting followed up, a lot's getting spent on marketing, like nothing's happening, turnover of employees, like all of these problems, is you get into a survival mode. And if you think about humans in survival mode, they care about nothing else other than surviving. This moment, today, this season, right now, nothing else matters. At some point, morality will break and they don't care what they have to do to survive in this moment right? Like at a certain point, that's what happens in organizations, especially when it comes to sales and revenue, when they're about to break and die, or they feel like that, or there's pressure and there's a board or there's investors or whatever there might be. Then what happens is the, the, the morality kind of gets loose and people go towards manipulation or they go to using some tactics that they no shouldn't do, but they've got to do it in the moment. And then it could become a pattern, 
right? So just tell these people these things, don't worry about this, or let's offer them these deals, which is a form of manipulation when you're you're basically bribing people with discounts. Um, and so then it becomes a pattern. The problem is, is you can't stop that. Um, part of this and, and one suggestion is obviously, have you gotten into that pattern? And then how can you fix that? How can you take care of the immediate need of where you're at? And then what do you have to put in place for long term to get away from it? You can't just hop from survival into stability or success. Like you can't just do that. Even if somebody's in survival mode and you give them a bunch of resources, right? Like you want to save somebody who's just struggling for survival. That's not going to do any good unless you have the fundamentals. So really it's, it's looking at the processes. What do you have in place? Like, why is this happening? What could you do with marketing? What could you do with sales? What kind of coaching does the team need? Do you have the right people on the team? I mean, that's a deep question. I can't think of any like one or two, like easy, low hanging fruits to, to yeah. save it. It's really like, not the, how did we get here? Because that's really tough and it could be a million different things, but what would it take to fix this? Like how many do we need? And then what's realistic? Because a lot of times it's, you know, and I'll say like, even from my own personal experience, like all this debt, all these issues in the past, it's like, I need all this money to just pull myself out of the hole. It's like, well, instead of that, how much do I need right now? What can I do in the next month? What can I do in the next six months? And just play the long game. Instead of trying to fix all this now, what can we fix long term, right? Kind of like your weight loss journey, an example. You didn't lose those 40 pounds in one month or one week. Like you started something that worked and then you kept doing it and it took some time. Same thing with sales organization. Look at this. What can you do this month? What can you do that will help? I promise you, here's a low hanging fruit. I promise you, you have a huge pile of leads of people you've talked to that you're not calling back, that your salespeople are ignoring because you're probably feeding them too many new leads and they're just fat and lazy with their feet up on their desk waiting for the new perfect inbound call that's going to close itself. Yeah. I promise. Yeah. I I love that. I think I think the biggest takeaway if someone is is listening to this right now and watching it's I would say one word reframe. Just reframing and pivoting those those bad habits. So I, I think that's huge for, for all of our viewers right now to kind of take away and take back to, you know, to their sales teams and really have an honest discussion about that, you know, and I know, I know we're coming up here on, uh, on time, Jason, but in, in closing, I kind of want to last two things here, touch upon, you talk about trying to figure out who you are as a salesperson. So quick piece of advice. Where do you start with that? Um, you know, I think it's really assessing your strengths. If you're in sales, if you're struggling, you're not getting the results that you want. Where I always start people is one of two things. One is your strengths and one is your why. Uh, why do you want to be successful in sales? In fact, I have this vision board challenge that I do with people. And it's really like, what would you put on your vision board? What's going to drive you so that you want to be successful for you? You don't need the carrot and the stick. And I won't go into all that stuff, but like you want what you want for you and your reasons. And the other part, again, is your strengths, right? What do you bring to the table? Not what do you see on TV? What do you think a salesperson should be? Like, what do you think that looks like? But what do you bring? What are your strengths? And then how do you apply those to your sales conversations, your sales process, your selling effect? How do you do more of you and what you're good at and move people forward? Mm. I, I love that. I think you're just such an incredible resource because it is, it's really, it's just such a mind, again, it's such a mindset shift. And obviously you have this book. Um, I did a deep dive, found your YouTube channel, but where can people kind of connect with you hear a little more about your story and kind of, you know, how you made this transition from studying marine biology to sales, because <laughs> I think it's fascinating and also why you excel at what you do. Well, thank you. And um, what I would say is the best place, and I've made it simple because there is so much that I put out there, is jasoncutter.com. So if anyone watching or listening, go to jasoncutter.com. And it's my hub for everything from podcasts to books to ebooks to training programs. Again, right now, just topical, you know, end of January as we're as we're doing this. Uh, I just launched a vision board challenge. It's free. It's a four email video series. I mean, if you're running a community, you want to just have your people get that and then they can help that use that as a free tool. I mean, it, it's really a powerful thing, as silly as it might sound to some people to put a board up on the wall of what you want, like in the movie, The Secret, 
Um, <laughs> yeah. Again, sales is such a tough mental game. You have yes. to have something to remind yourself to of why you want to pick yourself up when you're struggling in sales, which could be every hour of the day because sales is tough, right? If you hear no's enough, um, that's why I put that challenge together, just launched it recently uh, to help people just, like you said, reframe. Yeah, and I think it's a great way to kind of problem solve and like see what you're you're coming up against too and maybe a way to kind of figure that out. So I, I will definitely make sure that that gets dropped uh, in the description here of this. Again, I, I, I just think you're such a wonderful resource. You talk with such enthusiasm. And I think, again, if you know, you're in sales and you're watching this, I would just say, listen, that's, that is how you excel. And Jason, I just appreciate your time today. This was a great conversation. Thanks for having me, Rachel. It was so good. And uh, you did a great job filling uh, in and, and, and running this. So kudos to you as well. I tried. I am, I am no, no Steve Moran. So apologies as we continue to shift off the air if this, this goes very, very poorly. But I, I adore our audience. And thank you for your time and attention today. And thank you, Jason, for everything. Thanks for having me. Absolutely.